Hi, everyone, and welcome to the last session of the Flaherty X Boulder um, conversations, the live Q&As. Um, today, we are joined by Deborah Stratman. Um, we're so glad to have Deborah here. And I wanted to say um, that, so Munira Asol, who was originally slated to be in this conversation with Deborah, unfortunately can't join us. Um, she was in Beirut. Um, at the time of the blast. And we um, send our solidarity and our strength to Munira. Uh, Munira also sent us um, this morning a very impassioned and powerful letter. Um, and we are going to um, give some space to that letter. We're going to post it um, publicly on the um, on the Flaherty and the Mimesis pages. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, we're also going to post a link in the um, chat, in the comments um, for donations to the relief efforts in Beirut. So I hope that you um, all, if you are able, if you're financially able, we ask that you please um, send some solidarity to Munira. Um, to her daughter and her mother, um, who were all who all narrowly escaped um, the blast. And with that being said, um, we're super excited to still have Deborah here, and um, I'm going to introduce quickly um, Deborah, who is an amazing filmmaker and who has joined the Flaherty several times. And yeah, so Deborah Stratman is an artist and filmmaker interested in landscapes and systems. Much of her work points to the relationships between physical environments and human struggles for power and control that play out in the land, on the land. Most recently, they have questioned elemental and historical narratives about faith, freedom, levitation, expansionism, surveillance, and sinkholes. Stratman works in multiple mediums, including sculpture, photography, installation, drawing, and audio. She has exhibited internationally at venues including MoMA New York, Centre Georges Pompidou, Hammer Museum, and the Whitney Biennial, with the Witt Walker Art Center, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and has done site-specific projects and venues, including the Center for Land Use Interpretation, Temporary Services, Hall Walls Buffalo, Mercer Union Toronto, and Ballroom Gallery in Marfa. Stratman's films have been featured at numerous international festivals, including Sundance, Rotterdam, the Viennale, Full Frame, Ann Arbor, True Falls, CPH, Docks, and Oberhausen. She is a recipient of Fulbright and Guggenheim Fellowships, an Alpert Award and grants from Creative Capital, Graham Foundation, Harpo Foundation, and the Wexner Center. Stratman teaches in the School of Art and Design at the University of uh, Illinois in Chicago. So Deborah, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing right now? How are you holding up? I'm, I'm doing okay. Every day is, seems the same, um, but, uh, but some are different. Yesterday I went snorkeling to a, a oh shipwreck God. in Lake Michigan, which was amazing. That's incredible. Um, can we talk? Can you, I'm actually. I, so now and then, there's some interruption. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I just I'm new to snorkeling, and uh, I'd heard about this shipwreck for years. It's sort of you know, I guess if you're a Chicago and you know about it, but I'd never seen it. And a friend of ours, my partner and mine, who is a snorkel artist, scuba diver. He's like, I know where it is. So we just swam out there yesterday, which was totally great. <laughs> so a little, a little break from, um, yeah. I mean, I feel bad even bringing that up, hearing about Munir's letter and just how intense that whole experience is for them right now. So, um, but maybe, you know, take the good with the bad. Exactly, yeah, we take the good with the bad. And, um, you know, that it's, we honor Munira's um, strength and, and her work is so powerful and, and literally yeah. exemplifies, you know, this program is called Unwriting of Disaster. And, you know, we're looking to how artists in times of crises, um, you know, work with the unfathomable, um, work with mm -hmm. something that, can, that should be named, but almost can't be named. Um, right. And so, and so, you know, it's interesting that she did sh choose to write, and we will um, we will honor that absolutely. Um, but you know, I think that um, we wanted to pair you two as well, and and uh, it's it's really interesting thinking of of your film Village Silenced um, in relationship to these questions of um, 
of, of you know, how, how we can reinterpret and reimagine um, things from history that feel very present, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I guess the first question I have is what, what was your initial encounter with the film, The Silent Village? And like, what, what brought you to this work? Well, I actually knew, or I, I came to the work through the maker, which is Humphrey Jennings. Um, I first got to know about him through his work with founding, co-founding the mass observation movement uh, in 1937, which led to this kind of, um, I mean, some say it, it was sort of the beginning of surveillance culture, but in the beginning it had a very socialist kind of like, um, Mm, sense of trying to form the the history and sort of writing of 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 what's happening through the collective um, voice of people, and so I was interested in that movement. And then a friend of mine suggested to me his book Pandemonium, which is um, which he also he he started collecting observations in 1937 towards this book that's like a compendium of um, observers from the mid 17th century to the late 19th century who were sort of speaking about or or sp- speculating about um, industrialization even before it had happened. So it was a sort of um, writing about the machine age from outside of the machine age. So anyway, those two, those two things, those two projects were really what got me interested in him as a maker. And then I came to his film, not through seeing it, but I read about it um, and was just totally floored by its seat. You know, that he, if people haven't seen the film or don't know about it, he, he basically staged, um, so there was a there was an annihilation in the Czech village of Lidice, where the Nazis basically killed all the men who lived in the village, and um, all the women and children went to the camps. And less than a year after that happened, and this was a a, a sort of industrial a mining village. Um, Jennings asked the citizens of of um, Quimgud Quimgud. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. It's a Welsh town um, to reenact this annihilation. So it's not actors who are in the film, it's just the citizens who who lived there. And reading about that, um, A, I felt like it was totally kind of outside of time and ahead of his time and really moving, you know, this kind of, um, I guess I just wanted to make an homage to that act of performed solidarity. And um, so, so then I finally saw the film and was like, oh yeah, I definitely want to make this and it seemed okay to sort of, you know, borrow. I mean, I'm just I'm only using the footage that was in the original film, although it's it's restructured, re-edited, and then I add, add new soundtrack to it. Um, so yeah, that's a long way around about how I came to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of um, the the Jennings film is not only it, it ahead of its time in the sense that like. Um, that there was there was so much intention being put in place to like work with community, right? Like that this was such a this yeah. what the film was almost a, um, a a vehicle for which to kind of bring people to work through trauma, um, to process, really? and and yeah. and that that in itself like predates so much like social practice or you know whatever. And so yeah, it's really interesting that you. Um, you then you then kind of take this on. Um, there are many ways you could have worked with this material, right? But um, you chose <laughs> to focus on the sound, mm-hmm. and you know maybe we can um, talk talk about that because there's there's three distinct moments, and um, you know instead of let's say just carrying over one soundtrack the entire way you rework the sound in three different ways, including the third part, which has no sound. So maybe you can talk about the kind of three stagings of sound within that and and why you chose or or what you were thinking about when you decided to work in that way. Yeah, um, so sound is definitely, well, as in a lot of my work, it's really often a, a kind of protagonist and 
in this particular film because there's already the conceit of the car mounted um, horn. You have this sort of visual self visually as a kind of protagonist. Um, so then I, as you described, you, you see the same footage three times, but each time the sound gets replaced over identical image. So in a way it's a, it's a kind of flat footed, maybe sort of pedagogical response, but in a way I felt like the film is already setting you up to kind of think about propaganda and to think about, um, you know, this move by the, the Nazis in the first case, I guess, um, to have this, this, this act of kind of pasting a new sonic um, environment already what's over there, what's already there. So I was just picking up the torch that was established. It's like, okay, there's our act of putting, replacing one soundscape or landscape or reality with a new one that is the Nazi one where, you know, presumably they'd be speaking in German even though it was in the Czech Republic. Um, so I just thought, okay, I'm gonna keep doing that so that you, it keeps pointing the finger as I think Jennings did at what it means to kind of, you know, paste over. I mean, I guess I would say also what comes to bear in this film is just how central sound is for me um, because I, I totally believe that sound is what makes space or sound is space or is nothing without space. So it's, and it's expressed through and changed by space. So I, I really love making space with sound. I mean, I think making space with sound is, is pretty much the same thing as making forms with time. I find them both to be really interesting sculptural mediums. And, um, and I think the reason that, um, the other thing that interests me is just, is just the power dynamic there because we don't, always come to sound with the same critical faculties that we come to the image. I mean, we, in part, I think because the image always seems to be like over there in front of me, but sound, you're in the middle of it. And so you get overwhelmed by it. It can fool you more readily. You take it for granted more readily. Um, so both, you know, this film and then others that I've made it, it like refer back to that, refer back to that power dynamic that, um, sound can establish or you know the possibility of sound to be both a mode of social control but also a really profound act of resistance like the silence that you bring up in the last in the last um cycle it could be seen either as you know a lot of times we talk about silencing as a kind of oppression which it certainly can be to silence others but also silence can be um a kind of refusal you know like a general strike or silence and homage or memorial um, a disengagement from a kind of system. So as much as it can be a form of oppression, it can also be a wrench in the works. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that that hits the nail on the head, right? I mean, um, when we're thinking of, like you mentioned, Lenny Reifenstahl, who kind of pioneered, you know, not to give her too much credit, but also like credit where credit is due, pioneered the kind of propaganda mode of sound uh, image and sound. And so when we um, think about separating the image or, or uh, prioritizing the image over sound, it's to say that sound is doing its job. It's kind of washing over us um, mm. subconsciously and, and um, you know, changing our interpretation of an image um, without us even knowing sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so when you say it's a pedagogical tool, I think it's, um, yeah, it's a pedagogical tool, but it's also um, a resistance tactic mm -hmm. too, right? It's to kind of uh, show you how film is operating um, and to say that, um, you know, instead of using it um, blindly, um, that you're using it um, with full awareness to, um, yeah, like you said, point. Um, mm -hmm. to something. And, and maybe we can pick up on that, the pointing to something. Um, you know, this, this film very much makes history alive and, and in part, not in part, but centrally because of um, the way the sound functions. Um, it brings us very present and very close, um, close in, in the way in which um, the kind of Foley track are, are so, um, so well recorded, so close, so crisp. 
Um, and often we see historical documents as being something like removed from us, something that can't be as present or we don't view them as present. So what, what were the temporal concerns in your work? You made this in 2012, um, mm. but it, it was like a specific thing. And then also now, <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> thinking of the resurgence of neo-Nazism that maybe was always here underneath the surface, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, history is always happening. <laughs> it's always now. It's always like our relationship between today, the second, and the past, that that's what history is. It's not about just this, like, thing that you leave back there. It doesn't exist unless you're thinking about it now. So it's always about the tension between then and now and the shifted perspective perspective you may have. I mean, um, I guess my temporal concerns, uh, well, they're, it's hard to wrap them up. I mean, I think in part, one of my main concerns is how do I craft things where you can feel time, as you said, as something very present, very right, you know, very much like needle in the groove of the spinning record, you know, this sort of fleeting, breathing present, and at the same time, or maybe simultaneously, or at least in close proximity to have an awareness of that kind of long now, you know, centuries of, of sedimentary past. That's interesting to me. But, and another temporal concern is just to work with, to work with time as something plastic, you know, something that has volume, something that has, you can prep deflate. Um, and so I'm speaking in, you know, concrete material terms, but I think those things have, social political repercussions. <laughs> and and I think there's a certain, I guess, work, you know, we have to do when it comes to time and thinking about history that there's a, maybe not, I don't wanna say an obligation, but, you know, history, if we are talking, if we say the word history, we, t we tend to think of it as like framed by someone else's telling, right? It's their photograph or their words or their video image. And, and so, maybe our work as people who, who care about society is just to, to re-examine not just the story as, you know, as it came out, but how it was told. Um, and maybe that's what part of my art making is, you know, to, to sort of think back about like, oh yeah, what was that delivery mode and how might I want to re-deliver it? Or how might we, and how might someone want to re-deliver what I delivered? Like I don't ever end the book with me and just, it's part of a continuum. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a that's a great way to put that. And I, I always like thinking in terms of continuums, conversations across generations. Um, and I, I would say that um, maybe that brings a, a um, me to another question um, in terms of continuums. Uh, re you know, this this Jennings film was a reenactment, right? But you yourself also use reenactments in your work, reenactments, restagings, reinterpretations. Um, could you talk about this method um, throughout your practice and like what it what it also means to you? Um, you just picked up on some of that, but I also think about um, you know like the, the um, restaging of the FBI. Um, oh yeah, yeah. In uh, investigation um, in um, in Illinois uh, parables. Illinois parables, exactly. Yeah. And then, and you've also used restaging in some of your other works too. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, reenactment. Um, is something uh, maybe that's sort of new to me because I didn't, or newish. Um, I think because I didn't come to cinema vis-a-vis -vis or through theater and through narrative film. So to enact wasn't something I ever thought very much about. But the more I came to think about history, and you know, this film certainly points to it in the collective gesture of the villagers, the Welsh villagers. Um, when you have an embodied response or an embodied retelling reenactment it um it ritualizes it ritualizes the event in a way that is pretty compelling to me i mean i think we remember it differently because we don't just learn or know or see the thing but we we absorb it literally bodily and so it's a kind of it's a performed knowledge and and if you can perform knowledge then you own it uh, I mean, yeah, I guess that's the clearest way to see it. I mean, I think people own history in a different way if they co-perform it. So, um, 
you know, I was thinking a lot about how in Monira's film, you know, she talks about this difficulty of of riding the disaster, the disaster while you're mid disaster, and it totally made me think about how, um, do you know the um, the the I think she's Lebanese, the writer Etal Adnan. Um, she lived in, yeah. okay, so she's, I'm a super fan. I mean, just both of her painting, but especially yeah, her writing. And she has this beautiful book called Sit Marie Rose, um, where she talks about over and over how, how violence means, not just violence, but the disaster, whatever, the, the, the things that can trigger us to leave the world of ordinary speech. And in specifically, I thought about in Munir's film when she's describing the scene of the person who, videotaped the suicide of their partner. Um, and there's this line and uh, I, don't, I can't remember exactly what Manira says about it, but something about how death, uh, how visualizing the death sort of deflates it. And it made me think about um, Adnan when she says, you know, it, it doesn't happen that millions of people die. It happens millions of times that someone dies and thinking about like, yeah, what does that, um, that kind of mass, uh, consumption of an image of death, how it kind of deflates the, the really intimate specificity of it. I'm getting off track there, but I just feel like I want to bring her in because her work yes, um, made me, if nothing else, think about Etel Adnan, who, who I love so much. Absolutely. No, I'm glad you you drew in um, Etel Adnan. I think that her work is, is very present um, as we think about Beirut and Lebanon in the Arab world right now. And also, um, you know, I, I think that um, what you were saying about restaging and um, is, is also a, a method of empathy, right? And of connecting with something, um, embodying, as you said. And so I think that there's a level to that, that, um, you know, it, it works in different ways. And the ways in which we're able to um, hyper specify the p particular um, while also channeling the universal is when works become very, very powerful, right? Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I did want to ask, um, I guess just in terms of um, the ways in which, um, you know, th the distance functions, I guess, with, within your work and then also in Munira's work and, and a lot of other programs or uh, films in this program, this, this technique of kind of like... Um, removal you know that there's this play between um like found footage and mm -hmm. then have something really uh, powerful and impactful and and isn't just a historical document but becomes um very um uh we've already said present but um yeah i was wondering if you could talk about mm -hmm. that about like how how you play with um this technique of of distancing or of bringing something mm -hmm. very close um, I mean, I guess I just could say two things just in general, acts of removal or kind of, sometimes I think of it as distilling or kind of trying to get down to um, something more essential is, is just part of my practice more generally speaking. Um, not for every project, but I think there's, there's always something <laughs> useful about taking away almost always because my inclination is to sort of Baroque it up, and you know, there's so much in there that it's hard to to follow a thread. And I feel like sometimes, in a way, when you have less um, ideas to kind of be drawing um, forms between, you know, connecting dots, the more interesting the new forms can be. That sounds very vague, but. Um, it's kind of like making some kind of crystal or something, right? If you have too many, you don't see, it's just blobby. But if you have less and less points to draw from, suddenly it's like, oh, that's a tetrahedron. Or That sounds overly mathematic. I don't want people to think about tetrahedrons necessarily. But in terms of like the removal with the silence, um, I've used that kind of uh, removal of sound before. And removal of image. I think a lot of times it produces a kind of, uh, you're in the world of the film and then whoosh, you get, you're suddenly not in, you're more in your own body or something. Like taking away the sound creates a vacuum that makes you conscious, not just of your physical self, but 
of the conceit that was this this flow that you were in the middle of. So I like shifting that kind of consciousness about what sort of structure you're in, what sort of um, present you're. Again, I'm speaking really abstractly. Maybe you wanted a more political answer. I'm not sure. <laughs> No, not at all. Not. I mean, that was that was perfect answer. Um, I really love that. I also want to make sure that we um, that viewer any viewers or audience members know that they can drop comments or questions. Um, if you're viewing from YouTube, you can um, drop your comments in. Um, oh, okay. We have one from uh, we have one from Devin, who's a co-programmer. Um, in thinking of distance and sound. Hi, Devin. I, yeah, yeah. You know, Devin. Um, I think of the notion of the echo discussed in the last session. The last session was with um, Portia Cobb and Ngozi Onwara. Really amazing, Devin, um, you know, shout out to you. That was a great Q&A session. Um, I think of the notion of the echo discussed in the last session. Silence becomes space due to its distance. But we could consider aspects of time and could we consider aspects of time and memory within that? Um, it's an interesting provocation. So silence and... <laughs> I mean, in a way, I maybe I'm misunderstanding the comment, but I feel like it's actually difficult for me to theory or time or relationships for that matter without the gap. Um, I feel like I need the gap to think. <laughs> and without it, I'm not sure what there is. Same thing as, you know, a relationship with someone else and with yourself it's it's like you're able to see yourself better or where you're from you know if you leave home and then you're like oh that's what the deal was um but certainly you know you don't have connections unless there's space so maybe that's not getting to the echo exactly but for me the the place where there is nothing is is never not nothing it's always completely productive and and really essential Absolutely, yeah, and I, I also think um, bringing up the idea of the continuum as well, and the kind of like intergenerational conversations between filmmakers as a yeah. part of that echo, and um, maybe we could tie in the um, your 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 film um, with uh, Barbara Hammer. Um, oh yeah. Uh, in in relationship to Barbara Hammer, and then also to Maya Darren. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could maybe talk about that because um, it seems that there is a, a very um, a very uh, long line um, of of films that you're you're not only paying homage to but then also bringing together and it's not um, a straight line right you're kind of you're breaking up this notion of time um, and death too perhaps um, yeah. through film yeah yeah we we stand on the shoulders of our of our sister ancestors for sure, and our brother ancestors. I mean, I wish the the sister ancestry went back as far in the record as um, the brother ancestry, but we're making it now. Um, and I mean, I'm someone for whom homage is definitely an important part of my work, and 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 um, whether it's declared as directly as it is in uh, Village Silence, where obviously it's it's a, a nod to Jennings or or hacked circuit that you brought up before. Maybe maybe I use um, I lean on my ancestors even more than I give them credit for. But I feel like I I I'm me because of them. I think the thoughts I think because of the books I've read and the films I've seen, and and it just feels like you know, I don't feel like oh we have to footnote our lives ad infinitum, but. Um, <laughs> They're all just such interesting doors, right? And if somebody didn't know about uh, the village, the silent village, or if somebody didn't know about Hammer's work or Maya Darren's writings in Haiti, then um, I'm happy if the one thing my film does is get them to go out and investment or get them to go out and check out Jennings, you know, read about his mass observation movement or whatever. Um, I'm babbling. No, not at all. Um, I Echoes, really love though, what you yeah, said about that. The I, sisters, I mean, and, Echoes, yeah. Oops, sorry. I could say one other thing about working with Barbara and Maya, even though I Maya was already passed away when I was working with her. She worked with me. 
um, is just that it, um, when Barbara first approached me for that film to collaborate with her, it was pretty intimidating. And so to, when I had the presence of mind to bring Maya and sort of the resonances within her failed project also kind of in a, in a community that was outside of her own, not um, her like queer community in San Francisco, but Guatemala and same with Maya Darren who went to go work in Haiti when she had been sort of collaborating with dancers in New York, that both of those sort of acts of um, disorienting oneself were so important to me because being disoriented and kind of shaking out of habits of thinking even when those that shaking leads to a total mess or a failure or a project that doesn't come to fruition, I feel like are the are necessary nonetheless, and like allow you to see social um, dynamics and your own relationship to them, your own sort of messed up potentially power dynamics in relation to your subject in a way that's maybe more. Hmm, Maybe empathy is the wrong word, but um, you can see it. And at the same time as like being right there with people. How's that for a general? <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. Um, I think also, yeah, I mean, um, in relationship to this question of failure too, right? Like what what even is failure and when are we set up for success and and, you know, kind of, there was a it, there was a conversation last night with um, Joanna Priestley and Mary Filippo, and failure became a really central question in that regard too. And you know what what failure is for artists, right? Because now it's no longer a failure, and I think Barbara knew that, and and perhaps Maya Darren knew that too. That there that there was no such thing as failure, despite something right. maybe not coming to fruition in the way that they envisioned. So. Um, I really love that idea, and I love that how artists um, can pick up from one another and um, can continue the work, um, let's say, when times maybe aren't right um, for them, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of, that's like this utopian kind of vision or thinking, perhaps, that I, I do appreciate. Um, is or just this idea. letting the, also just yeah. letting, I think both of them as, Darren says like really concretely through her writing in the film, like be letting the material master you. I mean, you're always making things. I think I'll speak for myself. You make for the thing being born, right? You're, you're not hopefully making for, I don't know, whatever else for, for your own uh, fame or for, for the audience. I mean, I feel like what comes first should be the material and, and trying to, give that its due. So if there are times, there should be times when the material masters you, that should be part of the relationship. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great, that's something I definitely want to dwell on and think a little bit more. Um, Devin had another comment uh, to link both of the films. Um, I think he's referring to both Village Silence and um, uh, Verver. Um, am I pronouncing that right, Verver, is that right? Vever? Verver? I mean, I say Vever, but I honestly, I've never asked a Haitian person to pronounce it for me, so I don't know. <laughs> um, so if there's any Haitians out there in the audience, uh, please let us know. Um, to link both of these films, does the gap help address the um, racial political aspects? How in our current moment of disaster do we operate in documenting, seeing this world, uh, must we wait for a gap? So that's interesting. Yeah, thinking about um, kind of time, like when when is there enough time to address something? You know, like especially if we're close to the material. I think Munira's film really um, addressed that up front um, in terms of trying to write the disaster in the disaster. Um, but for you, I wonder if you could um, speak a little bit about that, um, how you deal with uh, um, the the, the di like maybe going back to the distancing um, of the subjects you work with through time. I mean, first I guess I'll say that it's okay to respond to the moment without thinking <laughs> and actually from a place of rage or from a place of total like, you know, crushing or whatever. And a lot of times as Adnan says, that's not a place of language. 
it's just not a place of language, but you need to respond to it nevertheless. I mean, I'll speak for myself personally to, to say something that's like quote unquote articulate. Yeah, a lot of times I do need more space, whether that's physical space, maybe it's, you know, cultural distance, right? You know, sometimes I think as there, sh as there should be, there's been a demand for more voices from inside of cultures where we haven't um, had a chance to see like representations of self or one's own community as much as we would like to. But I think just as much as we need that, there's often outsiders voices that um, I don't want to I don't want to let go of how valuable that can be in the mix. So um, I know, I think, yeah, you can, I hope we still respond in the moment. Sometimes that's just like in, um, oh God, what's her name? Uh, Michael Snow's wife who made Solidarity. Um, yeah, we screened that yeah. film to Joyce Wiley. Joyce, yeah. I mean, that's, um, for me, those marching feet, just like moving in response in the moment that that speaks just as eloquently as I'm sure Monira's letter or the, the script that's not the script does, you know, the, that actions and forms and, you know, there's other ways of speaking that aren't um, necessarily spoken that, um, you know, maybe everybody just needs to have some kind of choral moment, right? Like a, a collective choral thing or, Hmm. I guess I want to leave space for both. Um, and I, I know I'll just speak for myself personally that I will, it usually takes me maybe longer than most to come up with um, something to say, whether that's words or cinema or sound that, that, you know, I need more time sometimes to think through things and other people I'm, I'm amazed. I've been listening to a lot of, I have a project right now of Studs Terkel's radio interviews from the, 50s to the 90s and he did four or five interviews with James Baldwin and oh my god there's someone who can like take the moments and immediately just write it into the most eloquent statement I mean it's astonishing so obviously there's people who can respond in the moment to the moment with language on levels that are like just mind-bending um, Absolutely, yeah. Yes to all of those things. Um, creating in a space of rage, channeling that rage, channeling that chorus. Um, I think a lot of people can't help themselves. That's that is one way they deal with the moment is to process it through language or through other people's materials. As a filmmaker myself, looking to other people's materials and listening to other people's words and putting those words in conversation with other words is a way that I deal with kind of the present moment um, in a lot of ways. Um, so we have- a Are you a writer of, in, in your day to day? I, I, I'm actually a filmmaker also, um, but um, so yeah, so I, I'm a writer. Yeah, I do. I have, I recently <laughs> employed some um, writing in my own work um, as kind of influenced by other, other writers and artists as well. So it's interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but uh, we have a we have a comment from Eric uh, Eric Combs Esmail. Um, does this influence the selection of subject matter or technique? So maybe that's a interesting. Oh, it, it continues. Um, I wonder whether you feel the press feel pressured by the urgency of the contemporary moment, especially when operating outside of dominant cultures. Does this influence the selection or subject matter or technique? Um, yeah, that's so. I guess uh, in terms oh, of. Yeah. The contemporary yeah. moment infuses me. <laughs> I can't help but be um, affected by it. I think it's rare that, uh, I mean, I'm not a journalist and I, I'm very rarely making pieces um, that at least consciously are about, um, I wanna respond to that, that are that quick of a volley. But I think a lot of times I've found in my work, maybe something that I started three years before or 10 years before still really has a lot of resonance with the moment. So maybe I'm unconsciously um, doing that in terms of like what medium I choose and which might medium might be better for quote unquote the moment. Um, I don't know, I would say just the medium that you have easiest access to, <laughs> the, the tool that you can pick up, whatever tool that is. I feel like I don't think I don't have, I don't think there's a hierarchy there. Maybe a tool that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. So, because I think comfort sometimes um, 
isn't a friend to writing um, uh, truthfully. Yeah, absolutely. Yes to all those things. Um, I um, I did. Um, I wanted to um, say we have a we have a we're, we can wrap up in just a little bit. Um, okay. I um, I wanted to thank you again so much for um, t for joining us in this conversation or joining joining me oh, in this sure. conversation. But um, I was wondering, what are you what are you working on now? Um, what what's what's going on that you might want to uh, talk about? Well, uh, a lot of things are on hold. So I have I have fingers and a lot of um, a lot of dikes. <laughs> or that sounds very literal. <laughs> Not so literally, <laughs> but um, I um, I have an ongoing project I've been working on with about about sort of women's writing of history in Ethiopia and um, public voice there. That's that's on hold at the moment. Um, but well, I'll, I'll be coming back to it as soon as I can. I just can't travel there right now, but I've been working there for the last few years. Um, and what else? Well, there's this, I have a, sh uh, there's a show that's up right now that's called Feeling Tone. That's about the, the radio, the sort of oral historian Studs Terkel that you can, you can go online right now and listen to some of his interviews. I, I uh, curated 143 of his interviews out of about 5,000 with um, people he had on his show over 50 years. So it's not interviews he did for his books. If, if people are familiar with his books, like Working or Division Street America, they're all from his radio show. And, um, and uh, I'm working on a film about, sort of a sci-fi film about rocks. <laughs> About racks, what what kind rocks, of racks? Ro ro rocks, rocks, oh, rocks, stones. rocks. Um, I guess I would say it's about having a perspective that's um, outside of um, a human sense of scale, time scale, and a, and also just um, a perspective outside of our own species <laughs> is maybe another way to think about it. So yeah, I, I'm I'm yeah. working on. Um, ideas of mineral evolution, which is something that happens. Minerals have evolved, people. And um, and as well as resistance evolution, like resistance to um, microbial resistance actually is longer than the history of our planet. So it comes wow. from a time outside of our planet. So to me, those things come together in the film. Yeah, that, that sounds incredible. I mean, I love thinking about like deep, deep time. I think it's called deep time is like the time of- um, Yeah, the long now. The long now, yeah, deep time, the long now and, and resistance. That's um, a great way of putting that because that is such a interesting way to think about that um, species and, and um, this kind of, um, uh, yeah, interspecies dialogue that we might be able to generate. That's fascinating. We have a few, one, I guess one, one last comment. Um, hopping back to the notion of sound as the creation of space, can you speak to your richly layered soundscape and offering us a timely consideration of how an ideology or national identity is shaped? Yeah, um, Illinois <laughs> potential. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, the two, I mean, I guess, what can I say succinctly about that? <laughs> Just to keep questioning the narratives, the sonic narratives that are laid in front of us. Um, and I mean, I guess to go back to that sonic creation of space, it's not just that I want to reveal it and point a finger to it. I think what I love about it is also that it always, um, it always can move us, even when we are intellectually totally conscious that we're being manipulated. We still can be emotionally manipulated. So how that relates to like how to take on ideology or sort of contemporary sort of sonic landscape, I don't, I can't say in a succinct way, but, but I don't think, I, I wouldn't be interested in sound's ability to sort of, um, control us and, and are becoming aware of it if I wasn't also um, always moved by it. And always, so I guess I want us to be suspicious and also um, vulnerable. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that so much. Um, suspicious, being suspicious and vulnerable. Um, with that uh, being suspicious and, and vulnerable, um, Deborah, <laughs> thank you so much again. This was an amazing conversation. 
Um, I just want to give a shout out also once again to Manira Al Sol, who um, we will be dropping her letter online soon. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, please watch her film, um, Send Her Strength. And um, we also um, have just um, dropped the link to a website called, um, it's, it's uh, HTTPS um, LebanonCrisis.carrd.co. And that has a, that has a uh, ongoing list of um, several relief efforts in Beirut and Lebanon um, th that go to grassroots organizations and on the ground um, NGO. Um, oh, there's, and there's is the uh, Et al. Adnan uh, 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 book, um, Sit Marie Rose, um, the novel, um, really little, relevant. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Et al. Adnan. You won't regret very, it, you won't regret it. A Lebanese, yeah, she's a Lebanese um, a poet and painter and writer and just an incredible artist. Um, but if you have the ability, I highly encourage you to donate um, to one of those organizations listed on that website. And um, thank you all again for tuning in. Um, and uh, yeah, Courtney, Courtney says thank you. So thanks for tuning in, Courtney. Thank um, you. And, uh, thanks, Anil, for hosting. Yeah, thank and you again. And for your thanks thoughtful to questions. Thanks to the Flaherty. Thanks to uh, Mimesis. And um, everyone, enjoy the rest of your the rest of your afternoons and uh, look forward to your new stuff, Deborah. Thank you. Likewise. Okay. Bye bye. Oh, I'm sorry. We have uh, we have more conversations to continue uh, starting at 1 p.m. with the filmmakers throughout the rest of the festival. So stay tuned. If you're interested, uh, visit Mimesis Film Festival, uh, Mimesis Documentary Festival. Dot com, I think is the website. <laughs> Mimesisfestival.com. There we go. Thank you. And thank you again, Deborah. Bye.